Welcome to What CEOs Talk About. Do you wonder what CEOs talk about behind closed doors? How they bring their vision to reality? How do they overcome and succeed through adversity? We share that and so much more with each episode. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Hunter. I'm your host of What CEOs Talk About, where we talk about translating strategy into frontline operations. Today, we have Tom Dutta. So, Tom, pardon me, Tom Dutta, like... Dutta. <laughs> <laughs> I that in the pre-show I asked Tom, I was like, Tom, how do you pronounce your last name? And oh, that just made me giggle. <laughs> I, uh, we could have said Tom Duda like Buddha, but it wouldn't have gone well. It wouldn't have gone well. <laughs> uh Tom is the founder and CEO of Create. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Before that, he was a turnaround guy, CEO at the age of what you said, 21, something like that. Somewhere around there. Somewhere around there, and we won't tell his age right now. So, but you can tell from how he shaved his head, he's got something to hide, right? That's a, hey, that's a COVID haircut. Come on, <laughs> I got a COVID beard, so we're good. There you go. Um, he's a TEDx speaker, and we'll talk about that later on as well. Uh, radio and film producer, right? So we've got the Quiet Warrior that everybody should look into. So look at down below, and then you'll find the links to that. So, Tom, thank you very much for being on the show. I think I'm super excited today about because I think this is very impactful and love the title that we came up with. So what is your choice of the topic of conversation and title of the show? Yeah, I was riffing on this in my mind, man. And by the way, it's a pleasure to meet you and be on your show. Thank and you. And I, I, the one thing I'm an advocate for is, is uh, really looking at what CEOs don't talk about. You know, there's a lot to that. And I think that would be a great uh handle for this show yeah absolutely and at the center of what ceos don't talk about it's really mental health so that's the key thing so so tom's got an amazing story to share and i believe that there's a lot to learn from just your history and where you're at so let let's put it there so tom what's your story how does it start back in back in the <laughs> old days uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping back in, and you now if you if you hear the odd A, it's because I'm Canadian. I'm in Vancouver here, British yeah. Columbia, uh, greatest country and uh, greatest neighbor to your country. Uh, I, you know what, I say that at an early age, I became a manager at the age of 21, and and then became a CEO at the age of 31, and done different things up to chairman of the board. Uh, people say, what sectors did you work in? about five sectors across the borders to North America. And I was early successful at an early age, but I never discovered till later in life why. And so as I said in my TED talk that I, I wasn't a success chaser, I was a self-worth uh, chaser. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to some of the, the through line of this talk about mental health. Anyway, wind the clock backwards. I'm the son of Fijian parents. My parents' parents were from India, and I was born, Martin, in the UK on a military base. So there I was, and my you know, dad wasn't allowed to come down to the birthing because that's how strict it was. Uh -huh. I then came to Canada a couple of years later and the age of five or six. And you know, one of the other big things is I had to integrate into a country as a guy who has my color skin. Back uh -huh. then, I was a minority, and there was all sorts of issues around me. And in fact, not a lot of people climbed the ladder to that, that level that looked like me. Today, it's a melting pot. It's different, but there's still that through line of uh, what the R word. Uh, yeah. which I don't, I don't believe exists, by the way. So uh, let me tell you a story. In August sure. 25th, 2018, I was doing the Ride to Conquer Cancer. And okay. I was riding over two days up and down hills on my bicycle. I trained for three months to do it. It was 225 kilometers, or what you fellas will call 150 miles. <laughs> and uh, the first leg was 100. 25 kilometers and that night i stayed in a motel uh, uh which was base camp was actually a tent city there were t there was almost 2000 riders this ride by the way had gone on for 10 years the captain of my team he lost his daughter to leukemia at the age of 11. Oh, wow. i had actually gone into his boardroom and trained him and all his partners because that's part of my work i developed leaders and in that boardroom i didn't know his story 
over a beer one day. He said he's going to be riding in the ride to conquer cancer his 10th year. And he was going to cross the million dollar fundraising mark. And I went, dude, I'm in. And I'm on my patio, by the way, Martin, I don't have a bike. I, I've never done more than a 5K when I was a kid. And uh, I'm three months of this thing. And he goes, well, people usually train for six months. I'm going like, hey, you're talking to somebody who has no, the word no doesn't exist. So I'm in. So I got a bike. I bought it for my buddy, John. And I trained for three months. I hit my first century uh, ride on my own training, it was 30 degrees Celsius, almost a hundred degree heat. Fires were burning in the province of BC because of the season. Yeah. And I was riding in heat and smoke. And man, when I crushed a hundred kilometers in my first two months, it felt amazing. And for the, you know, the people watching this show, you know, CEOs, a lot of times we're built because we have this resilience to push through adversity. You know, when, when a company says board or somebody hires you saying, we want you to build this and turn it around or do this, uh, the average person might say, that's going to be tough and think about the dark side. But, you know, we're, we're sort of developed to just say, you know what, we're, we're going to make it happen. So uh, anyway, so there I was and I did the ride. But first night, my wife was with me. She brought her SUV. I stayed in a motel. I stepped into the bathtub to have a shower and it was like ice. My uh, feet started skating around and within seconds and maybe not even that I fell hard backwards now I'm 5'11 the tub was very small and landed and like a battering around my head rammed into the back of the tub surround and cracked it I blacked out and uh, when it came to I was literally sitting with my hands on my head my wife I screamed and she came in and she found me I'd suffered my first ever uh, serious brain injury and not only that but I slipped into uh, unrelated or related issues, which they never talk about much. Can, uh, athletes don't, but depression. <laughs> Had my first thoughts of suicide a few months later. And my eye, where I hit my head, my eyes controls, it didn't, my eyes wouldn't focus. So the light, like a lot of times I got a light here in my studio, I'm wearing sunglasses. Still today, they don't work well. I can't do a lot of work online for a long period. I have to pace it. What I'm trying to say is, is that I got, I was slept in bed. I think I was leaning on the nights uh, the backboard of this bed uh didn't sleep at much uh okay. just pounding headache i didn't know i was concussed because how would you if you didn't yeah. you just thought i rung my bell my wife said because i had to be in the team truck at 5 a.m she said you should cancel and i said no and i said this i never forget it i said the people i'm riding for couldn't have a choice when you have cancer you don't have a choice so i'm gonna ride but the good news is martin is every 10 kilometers there are uh, emergency services, lots of mm -hmm. care. They could come pick me up if I had problems. Yeah. So Anna gave me a bag of ty a Tylenol and uh, chewed that on the ride. I was last coming in. There was no time frame. And I, I struggled, man. It was raining. My head was pounding. But I, I did 100 miles that day. And I, I just wanted the medal so I could tell the story to anybody, you know, who's lost someone to cancer or is battling it, that, you know what, I fought for you. And, but, uh, didn't know I had a concussion, got in the SUV. I said, Anna, take me home. I slept all the way home. Uh, my daughter was home from university that, that summer, this is August, and we were sitting in the living room where I am now. And my daughter gets up and walks by me and she says, Dad, there's dried blood on your head. And my wife comes and looked and she said, oh my God, there's, there's lacerations, dried blood. Turns out later we found, because we took a picture, that the markings on my head matched the crack in the bathtub. <laughs> That's how... <laughs> Uh, so it's like, wow, and there's proof. Uh, but everything stopped, Martin. Everything stopped. I slipped into uh, depression quickly because when you get concussed like this, if you are your work, I didn't have an employer. I have my own company that I built. Yeah, you, there's no benefits. There's no things to look after. You can't go and say, well, I'll do the mail today and sit in a room by myself. You're it. And I had built my radio show, my brand, The Quiet Warrior, written a book that became did well and uh, had been uh, out in corporate America training and teaching leaders for uh, years. And all of a sudden I was hiding it. So I literally stayed at home for a year and I didn't go out. I ruminated and that's what led to a lot of mental health. And uh, they, I think 12 specialists later, they're still trying to figure out some things. Uh, but that's how, that's where the story started. I mean, I'll give it back to you if you, you want to ask me more about it, but there's chapters that come through that, that led to uh, what am I going to do with this? And I decided to do something big with it, which was create a mission to help leaders lift the stigma of mental health. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, everybody's got their stories. I mean, I've got 
during my military career back in the day when I was in the army for 10 years, when you came back with PTSD, it was like, suck it up, buttercup. It, yeah. it, there wasn't the support that we have. And I've got clear demonstration that two of the people that worked for me while we were overseas on mission came back and killed themselves. And so suicide happened with a father of three children in his basement. And then one guy uh, addressed a letter directly to me uh, because he was going to have a second kid and didn't think that he was worthy of that. So that's phase number one. So, yes. And then the second component, like you, um, at the age of 28, I was in charge of 328 people and doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And I hit a ceiling as well. I come from my father was an alcoholic as well. And so always kind of, even if I was pulling in good grades, can you do the better? Can you do better? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I bring in chemistry was chemistry and physics were my, my good thing, but you know, I bring in a, a, an A, like how come you didn't get an A plus. Right. And yeah. so, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I had to, hey man, I had to make the bed every morning and the coin had to bounce off the sheets. Uh, oh, I, I, I was my, there. <laughs> my, 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 my dad would like, he was a perfectionist, but also driven. He put a piece of cardboard across the wall at the top of the wall in my bedroom. And you remember, I'm like six, seven, seven years old. And he had written in big letters, capital, the letters of the alphabet and then small. And then below that, the timetables, like one times one. Man, when I was in I, when I was in grade school, I was already up to twelve times table when nobody knew what timetables were. <laughs> but it's it, but it's true. And this is a thing lead back to the leadership uh, that we talk about. Uh, everybody I've interviewed or met, you all and coached. And man, in those in those cone of silence, when you're an executive coach, which I do as part of my my company, the I call it the blood on the shirt. You see it; it comes out. The stories seep out on the table of all the despair, uh, family, personal life, business is all connected. And so these people who by just like you and I, good people, um, probably succeeded to the top because we were standing on the shoulders of greatness around us. That I always like to say that if you're driving a one ton pickup truck, and by the way, I got to tell you, my father-in-law, Andy, passed away uh, years ago. Be amazing man. Came from Italy. My wife's and is Italian. And he used to have this red pickup truck. We used to hear these all these stories about it from him. Oh, this is my truck. And he used to paint it with a little paintbrush. And that truck, man, I have I have that truck in my mind. And somebody said to me once that your brain is like a one ton truck. The payload is one ton. Now when you climb the ladder, by the way, the the levels from a ground floor worker to supervisor to manager to uh, director, VP, and then you have executive level, which is CEO, the C-suite. Most people aren't prepared. I was never trained. When I got to the CEO level, nobody told me what it was. And the one thing I, I will share with you, somebody gave me a book and it said, becoming a CEO and staying at the top. And the one thing that wasn't lost on me, Martin, is this one thing I read that said, when the CEO sneezes, the office catches cold. So we own culture at that level. So everything we do matters. So if we're not caring for ourselves, what happens is as you get to that higher level, the pressure comes. Now you have the board of directors. I had five vice presidents. My board of directors was in Baltimore, Maryland. I lived in Canada. Man, the cross cross uh, border flights for 3 a.m. my time board meetings in front of 10 high powered financial. Are you kidding me? And I had a young daughter at home and I orphaned her for many years flying all over the place. And I thought, wow, I got a big paycheck. We did well. But that one ton truck all of a sudden had three or four tons in the payload. And what happens when a truck's overloaded? The gasket blows. Mm -hmm. So my comment to the watchers, your amazing audience is, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when darkness will come. Our brains weren't created to handle that level of pressure and stress by medicating with alcohol, booze, drugs, porn. I mean, I said that in my TED Talk, if you watch my TED Talk. I said, we, we saw, you know, we look after him. That's the title hockey. of your TED Talk so that we can put uh, it at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, how leaders can lift the stigma of mental health. And I, I call out the leaders in the world. I started a mission with a unique idea. I call out the leaders in the world and say that they're the responsible for lifting the stigma. Mm -hmm. They're also responsible, in my belief, for creating the stigma of mental health.
And I take flack on that, but I, listen, I was one. And when I slipped and fell and got injured, I ended up going into Costco as a produce stalker working night shift in the cold zone. You know, I ended up waiting tables in a restaurant just to get through and keep my body active because the doc said, get your butt out there and do something. Don't mm-hmm. worry. I worked with the pe- real people who run the, run the world, and that's the workers on the ground floor. And man, there was mental health issues all over the place. And when I started to see looking up at the, at the penthouse, what I called it, my TED talk, I started to see me, these hard driving managers who didn't really care if you had enough resources. They didn't ever came on the floor and said, how you doing? It's a tough day today. We're having a walkthrough and I'm feeling a little pressure. How about you? They were not talking about their own mental health. Uh-huh. And, and, and so this is the thing about caring for this thing that sits on our neck. Uh, you got to get a checkup from the neck up. So what do CEOs not talk about? It's, it's not just mental health, but it's, it's their own lived experience. Uh, so that you and I, like when you told me your dad was an alcoholic, man, right away, I'm in rapport with you. And I'm going like, I, this, this, I like this dude. I can follow him. He yeah. can lead, lead me anywhere. Everybody has mental health, everyone. When, it become, when stress becomes distress and mental health, the gasket blows, that's when you have a problem. And it can be serious for leaders. Uh, careers, families, uh, yeah. even tragic. The one of the episodes, uh, previous episodes with Jeff Livingston, we talk about uh, self care, right? Yeah. And so self care is is head down, right? So I always rule of three in everything. So how does your head feel? How does your heart feel? How does your body feel? Right? Because yeah. it's your mental capacity, your physical capacity, and your your kind of your heart, your motivation, right? So. It, it always comes back when you strip away the house, when you strip away everything, I tell my kids this all the time, what do you got? What are three things that you're left with? Your knowledge, right? Your physical ability to do something yeah. and your motivation. So a lot of leaders forget that those are the three human capacities or biological capacities. How do you motivate dogs? My wife's a dog trainer. She uses a clicker, right? So, and I'm not saying that employees are dogs. I'm saying that you, there are certain things that motivate us to be able to do that. So that's your heart check, your mental ability. You know, a lot of people say, oh, leaders are readers. No, leaders are learners. People are curious who want to learn more, right? You talk about um, Elon Musk, you talk about Apple, you talk about all these people that are breaking the forward thinking momentum of just breaking the status quo, right? I don't like this today. I want to do something better. And so they become curious, right? The Wright brothers would have taken flight if they didn't believe in what they said. So I think that that health check is to be really in tune with yourself. You journal, right? I journal constantly. At the end of the day, how much have I worked? How much have I tracked? When we look at continuous improvement of plan, do, track, adjust. How many CEOs actually track their time? We don't punch clocks. I get that. I get that. But you cannot create prosperity, right? For me, you've got profit plus sustainability equals prosperity. You know, I've worked with BNSF Railways. I've worked with Tyson Foods about safety itself. And it's not about safety first. It's about safe production, which is different. Yeah. yeah. And the, so... So yeah, in that in that absolutely. framework, you, you gotta you gotta make sure that you as the CEO, because it's important, I think this is a great lesson that you're demonstrating is that stop looking at where you're going and start thinking about where you are today. And there is a saying that says, I want to be where my feet are. So yeah. when you're sitting at the kitchen table yeah. or at the dinner table, are you present? And same thing in the room. There's like your truck analogy. I'm like, okay, am I watching all the gauges? What's the payload capacity of my truck? Have I measured what's going into the truck? All these questions that yeah. you should ask yourself. And that demonstrates true integrity and true self-awareness, I believe. And that I think if if you know to kind of rally what you've said in the past minutes, that's kind of where you're at, right? You got to be really self-aware where you're at so that you don't step on the tripwire, right? That's right. And, you know, one thing you said that resonated was about, uh, well, I thought about 
my my brain go is it's multi-dimensional i've been told i can jump quadrants so you'll hear me say i'm i'm riffing or i'm going on a journey in my mind and one of the things i thought about was warren buffett and i think he there was a quote made that uh, the uh, some of the most or the most successful people say no to everything and i remember saying that to a young up-and-coming leader once in a one-to-one coaching session I said what and I was, when I was crazy in my job, I was flying to Florida from Canada to host a VIP event for the company I was the head of. And it was to bring 10 of our clients who were president CEOs of their companies. Uh, it was a shindig, right? It was like, we're going to do a, a few hours of business, some PowerPoints, meet the head office folks. And then we're going to go play golf at one of these amazing golf <laughs> courses. And of course, my dad taught me to play golf when I was a kid. My dad was a scratch golfer. He always won everything. He was an electrician, then he became a teacher as well. So there's a thread of that in that I'm an author. Uh, I I remember dad had wooden clubs, man. That was something else to see. (laughs) I mean, Jack Nicholas, and you see some of these guys when they started their careers with wooden clubs, that's the clubs my dad taught me to play. How did I get on that? But going back to, uh, you you know, this, this thing that it's deeper. Mental health is actually a lot deeper than just you have generalized anxiety. You have uh, mm-hmm. depression you have let me try and teach the audience a few things i learned but and then i'll explain the deeper yeah, because I, my whole uh work body of work including the other things i do linked to the company is to teach why people do what they do see i can sit here and say to you uh, you're standing there and you're quiet and you're you just sip the cup of coffee and i can make judgments about what i think of you but if i went below the waterline and learned why the motive that right. changes everything because when you learn motive, you can actually make deep change, which is very hard, especially when you're talking about your own character as a leader. And uh, you have to dig and do the hard work, which very few people do about what was wired into your brain in your first 10 years of life or so. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about Tiger Woods for a moment. It was a terrible accent that he just had, but I want to talk about something he taught me through one of his books. He said, visualize when you're standing on the tee, like his dad taught him the the ball going in the cup mm-hmm. don't don't see the crowd here don't see the bunker don't see the birds flying above don't see the water see it see the end in mind and what what ha- happens is our brains don't know the difference between uh, f- facts and our imag- imagination mm-hmm. so if i continue to say with vibrative words which vibrate the subconscious mind we all have that part of the brain which most people don't access because they don't know how which is a huge hard drive of our, our, our brain. But if you continue to visualize, you do a vision board and you visualize and say things over and over again, you'll, your brain can't tell if it's actually here or not. Right. And so it'll drive your behavior. What happens uh, is we have thinking traps. And when I was concussed, I was sent to cognitive behavioral therapy and it changed a big part of my life. What I learned is that we can learn skills to prevent mental health, we can learn skills when we are mentally unhealthy to live uh, a good life with mental health issues. The definition of depression, by the way, is two or more weeks of sadness without a trigger. Two or more weeks of sadness without a trigger. So the world, you know, the the problem I have with mental health is everybody's a doctor and everybody takes the the word. So somebody says the word depression, all of a sudden, oh, you're, we don't go near that guy. But where do you think we got some of our impressions of mental health, the stigma? I'll tell you, when I grew up, uh, Jack Nicholson, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, was on the TV. At a young age, all that, because our brain doesn't know the difference, it literally pours in information and stores it in neural nets that are wired together, thoughts and emotions in these little vessels. And so, you know, we grew up watching those uh, hospital scenes where they're giving people shock treatment and some of those crazy. The, when we were born into this world, Martin, we, I promise you, we didn't come into this world with the stigma. It was put in us by others because crap was put in us. That's not true. So depression is two or more weeks of sadness without a trigger. Here's how your brain works. It's I call it the the uh, the the dot, the diamond of thought. So if you look at a baseball diamond, uh-huh. you're at home plate, base one. So home plate is a trigger. Uh-huh. Ba- ba- base one is a thought. Base two is an emotion or sensation. Base three is a uh, behavior. 
So all all our brains do, I learned, is our brains basically are thinking machines. That's all they do. So all of a sudden, you know, I get in my studio here and I see you pop up. My brain's going like, I got to tell Tom what's going on with his reality. What's this person here? And so then my brain doesn't go and look up an encyclopedia. It goes to the neural nets and finds things similar and says, this is probably Martin because you have an appointment scheduled for an interview because I'd never seen you before. How did I know it with you? Because my brain went and found the information. Mm-hmm. So what happens at a young age is up until about age 10 or 15, maybe even 20, there's a part of our brain we don't have the use of, which is called the prefrontal cortex. Mm-hmm. That's actually the rational part of the brain. And it actually, somebody showed me this in my, tr- my training. I'll show you. I have a fist here and it sits on top, it sits on top like that. Mm-hmm. And it, the prefrontal cortex uh, basically has you pause after uh, first base. So first base, remember you have a trigger. So let's say, say the trigger is, uh, I see a picture of a car and my brain's going to say, we got to tell Tom, what is that? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, maybe there was a bad car accident and a friend of mine was hurt. So my brain would go looking for things. All of a sudden, maybe that car represents danger. So my, my brain could go from thought to sensation and feeling of being anxious, remembering all that stuff, not feeling very good about the car. And then what's my behavior? I might run away and not go and get in the car. Uh, or I might be foolish and you know go drive the car fast because my friend did that before he got killed. When we pause at the thought, when we pause, that's actually the prefrontal cortex that kicks in. And they, up until about age 20, children don't have that developed. They don't even have it existing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah that risk-taking factor really kicks in as well, biologically as well. So, so I'm, so I'm going to go deeper with this. This applies directly to CEOs and leaders that if we come from a, a, a childhood and we're influenced with words, thoughts, media, whatever, and stuff's put in our neural nets, that's wired together. If we have trauma, like, you know, violent uh, father who drank like mine, you know, I took the brunt of it. Uh, later in life, when you're a CEO leading people, I can sit in a room, and this is absolutely true for me, it's part of the film project we're, we're doing, and I could look at you around at a boardroom table with 10 other people, and you could just do something that my brain said, that looks like your father. And all of a sudden, my fight or flight response wow. kicks in and I get all anxious or I want to fight. And so I've been in boardrooms, actually, or in meeting rooms with, I was a general manager of a financial company. I was hired for a couple of years on contract to turn it around locally here. And the, the owner would come in, nice guy, tall guy, very affluent, and he would bat people over the head in meetings. He would purposely do things to, to, to create a problem. And he was toxic. And so that person, I had my, I would literally nod up in my stomach and I would turn into an emotional puddle and I could never understand why. So throughout my career, because I I didn't explore the wiring in my brain until Mm -hmm. I I had to, I was, when I had difficult bosses, uh, difficult board members, I would self-sabotage my own success. So people would say, wow, you've got a great job. You know, obviously you look like you make a lot of money. And, you know, my wife would say, you're a good looking guy, honey. And, and I could never see it. And there was something missing. And I was always tearing down my success. So out, through all my self-development personally, what I found is what my father had done in our household wired into me a set of rules that only apply to unhealthy relationships. And I took that out into corporate America, you know, command and control, drive hard. This is my agenda. I didn't have really care about the small stuff. How are you doing today? Or if you're overloaded and the truck's getting full and it's going to blow a gasket. When I finally unraveled all that, and that was, I turned 31 when I became a CEO the first time. And it was a turnaround job that was a hard job. The company was falling apart. They gave me a coach and the coach followed me around. I didn't want it. I actually said, I don't need that. I denied it. I blind spot. And she broke me one day in a boardroom and said, you know, if you're going to be be here long term, you're going to have to make some change. And I dismissed it. And she kept hammering with feedback that, you know, you sometimes people say you're grandstanding. Sometimes people think it's your way or the highway. And I'm going like, who? Who are you talking to? And finally, at a magic moment, I welled up, my eyes, my tears came out, and she broke me. And you know what I said? I'm vulnerable to say it to you publicly. I said to her, and she was from the other side of our country, and she's a high paid psychologist. I said, stop, you sound like my father. And I started to cry. 
I started to cry. That was a moment I discovered that there's something else going on in me. And see, my dad, I always had to get straight A's. The only time I felt love for my dad, and he was sick himself. So I, I love my dad today. I finally figured out that his childhood was alcoholism. So he brought parenting skills into my life that were bad. But my dad always wanted more. So I, my brain went, wait a minute, to get the love you really want from your father, you have to go and achieve things. So I kept getting jobs and going up the ladder more, and more, 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 and pushing people and driving. Man, I was winning awards and things. So how many CEOs do we know out there or, or top leaders? So let's be clear. CEO, uh, business owner, entrepreneur, they're all in that category. If you own your own company, bravo, because there's more pressure because you wear all different hats. But how many can we think of? And I bet you you can find one that drives, drives the ship hard and pushes people. They, if they can probably spend some time finding out the why, because you know what? It's generally not your board that tells you to burn people out. Oh, no, 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 absolutely. I think, you know, the one thing that I, the tool that I use that is very similar because I learned this from Berkeley as well, is that people use a think, feel, do process, right? So they'll think, and what a lot of people and leaders forget is that there's a feeling process. There's an emotional component that drives action. And that, that emotional component is pain or gain. It's as simple as that. We're very binary creatures with a complex system that ultimately decides what is painful, what is gainful. And what ha has what happens all the time is a CSO. I told that person to do so. Well, I told them, yeah, that, that's very cerebral. But how are they feeling about doing that? Are they overwhelmed? Or like, is their truck full? To use your analogy, have you done your servant leadership? Have you asked the right question? So it's easy to tell people what to do. And then that servant leadership is to turn that into a question. So there are tools out there to think about mental health and the emotion that it drives, because I think that you nailed it. If you've gone two weeks, now think about startups where people are excited, but some people at a certain point, you go, I'm burnt. Like this COVID thing? For many CEOs that I deal with, everybody's exhausted. Everybody's like, I'm like, I'm working twice as hard now that I have before. Right. Where's the balance? Where's the prosperity? Yeah. And so that drives a whole bunch of actions. You know, alcohol consumption has gone through the roof. And right. So uh, pet stores. So pet stores, people have been buying dogs. What happens to these dogs when COVID is going to be done and people start traveling again? Right. Yeah. Alcohol consumption is gone. Cannabis Absolutely. is legalizing across yeah. both countries. And so there's consumption attached to that. So the point that I'm that I'm I'm trying to really emphasize on what Tom says is that when you are the leader, ask yourself, think, feel, do. Okay, how am I feeling? Let, let me think about this for a sec. What's my emotion? Don't negate your emotion, understand them, wield them. It's okay to be angry. Don't, don't um, accept it, understand it, but don't let it drive your actions. And so many people are so caught up in doing, doing, doing as CEOs. I got to achieve. I got to achieve. I got to achieve. I got to achieve. And they go, hold on a second. What am I achieving? Isn't today what we need to do? Is not today? Because tomorrow doesn't exist. What the, my kids always say, Ugwe, the uh, Kung Fu Panda. Uh, the, I love this one. He says, yesterday's history, tomorrow is a mystery. And do you know why we call today the present? Because it is a gift. And that from a TV show, from a movie, a cartoon, I was like, Damn, that, that is deep, Ugwe, this turtle. Tell I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta give you a compliment. If I took some black shoe polish, put it on your eyes, you kind of with a beard look a little bit like that fuzzy, hug, huggable guy. But I want to, I, 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 I jump in and just go, you know, honor what you said, first of all, and, uh, you know, what CEOs talk about, the angle that, you know, I'm bringing to your shows, what CEOs don't talk about. And also, I said motive, why? 
So yeah. there's, uh, pardon me for saying it this way, I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, but there's so many gurus and teachers yeah. and gobbledygook out there. To be honest with you, everybody, it's not that complicated. We have yeah. to uncomplicate mental health. And, and the one thing I advocate is every leader, if you're a CEO or a top leader, should have on their scorecard, which is their uh, performance goals, self-care. I call it self, self-compassion, but goals for self-compassion, because if you, I said this in my TED talk, it's a bold statement. You can watch it, everybody. I said, when leaders fail to take care of their own mental health, they undermine the importance of the mental health of all the people that they're leading. Le- leaders, we need to show that our strength is in our stories of struggle, not in our silence, and that it's okay to say when you're not okay. So when I was on the ground floor stocking produce in Costco for a period of time, and man, that was hard for a guy like me because physically I hadn't done that type of work. There would be four, they did a door count. Okay, this is COVID times, early COVID. COVID happens, boom. If you've been to a Costco, the door count they do every hour tells how many people are in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. There were 400 to 1,000 people in the warehouse at any point in time. And it was like sardines because that's how it is. Mm-hmm. And COVID was going on. So all of the employees, you know, were wearing masks. Many of the people coming in didn't wear masks until they made it mandatory. What's going on in me on the floor? I'm stressed out because people are in my face. I have to be polite, do my job. I know I'm going to go home and risk infecting my 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 children uh, through cir- distant circles. My mother, if yeah. it with with the with the the virus, I didn't even know anything about. I didn't see a lot from the penthouse, from the general manager level down, any kind of uh, communication work to to address the employees on a regular basis, to find out how they're feeling, to let them know it's okay to say you're not okay. I would go to meetings with my with my fellow produce stockers and hear you know the uh, the old school manager talking about goals. We got to get hit a million dollars in sales. We got to do this. And I'm going like, dude, do you not see? And by the way, are you not cracking a little bit under this? But if just for a minute that leader stood up and if say it's me and you're my team member, a meeting with you and our team said, Hey, how's, you know, is anybody feeling a little bit stressed out right now? Cause I'm telling you that we got a lot of people come to this warehouse and this COVID thing's hitting. How are you feeling? And I want to tell you a story that I went home last night and my, my daughter had a, a sniffle and she had a, a cough. She got a fever and I didn't know if she had COVID or not. And that was on my mind when I came into work today. So I just want to let you guys know that I know there's a lot on your mind like that, but if you need to talk to your manager, have an open conversation, because we want to be there. Call the 1-800 number. We have support for you. Here's the thing. I read an, I, I read an article, Martin, and you got me going here emotionally. I read an article that uh, uh, Walmart had put out, and it was a great article. It was a press release, and there was a quote in it from the CEO, and they talked about, this was a couple of years ago after I got concussed because I was looking for things to do while I was sitting at home. <laughs> and I was scouring the internet for mental health things because I was writing my TED Talk. And this article said they're going to op- look at opening pilot clinics in the United States and Walmarts for counseling. The other side of the article said, I wonder how many people will actually use it if there's a stigma. They, would they want to be seen going into a psychiatric or counseling clinic in a Walmart by their neighbors? I read the whole article and you know what was missing? And this is where I live now because people hire me and I, I look at things and I find, find the stigma. The CEO had a huge opportunity to write a story, small one, about a lived experience with mental health, why it matters to them, and why this strategy for Walmart may make such a difference. Yeah. There was nothing. They were silent. And in my TED Talk, I said the CEOs, by nature of what they do, they're not smarter or better people. In fact, sometimes the people around us are smarter. We hire them to make us smart. The, 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 the CEO uh, at, at that opportunity has the megaphone. When, who gets called by media when or the company gets called by media? Who do they want to talk to? A lot of times the leader, the top yeah. person. So we have the megaphone and we have a voice that gets listened to. We have newsletters. We get on media because of the nature of what we do. All the people working below don't always get that. He could have said something. So one of the things I'm talking about is even if you're a, a chief exec of a company and you have a board, the stigma is there. For a long time in my career, and I said this in the TED Talk too, that I was hiding it. I was living the stigma instead of lifting it because I didn't want to be seen as weak. 
because if all of a sudden that someone, is some, the key. However, that is the key. However, however, every board person around that board table has some form of lived experience and is sitting in that meeting a little bit anxiety, anxious, a little stressed because they just had to look at a ton of information. Mental health is normal. Why do we go get a checkup for our heart or talk about things that are wrong with our body? But we don't talk about that. Find, build relationships. We all know how to do it. I did it with my board. Get to know. I, I want to stop you there because I think there's a, there's a good lesson there. Just what you said is that there's high level of expectations, right? That's right. For as a father, right? I want to be the best father I can be. I want to be the best CEO as it can be. And so this pride gets in our way of saying, hey, I need to show everybody that I'm not afraid of everything, of anything, I should say. I have to be the one that demonstrates, let's carry on, move on, folks, you know, drive on, right? And instead, just be a normal human being. Stop focusing on the result and saying, hey, I'm scared. Well, and it's okay to be scared. That's what yeah. a lot of people don't understand. Courage and vulnerability, if you listen to Brene Brown, right? Courage and vulnerability are go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You can't be courageous without removing your armor and showing the world right. who right. you truly are. So a lot of you know what CEOs don't talk about is really saying, okay, I'm afraid. I don't have to be this this ultimate pedestal role model that is not afraid of everything, who's the chief of everything that, you know, whatever comes, I'll handle it. Yes, but it's okay to be nervous. The yeah. Foreign Legion, the French Foreign Legion has a saying that I absolutely love, and I'll translate the best that I can. It says, when the leader, and this is the stigma that a lot of people have, right, is when the leader sits the followers lay down. When the leader doubts, the followers despair. And so that saying, saying, well, you shouldn't sit down. You should not despair, right? It's, it's, it's okay to be doubtful. Just embrace the momentum and compassion. I think that, that word is that you mentioned, right? that's, there are ways to go forward without being self-destructive or viewing yourself as the savior to the world or to your business, right? Or to somebody else's business. Yeah. And, and I want to just riff on that. Okay. Because this is part of, I try to teach and give some value on, on the interviews I do that I talked about the why or the motive going deep. And we still haven't, we still haven't got to the bottom of why, why do people do what they do in cases where mental health is the condition, but what are the symptoms? Now, my, I want to just go in a few directions here with you for a bit. So my father was learned to swim in Fiji. He was pushed off a bridge, all right? And my father's dad was an alcoholic. So my dad then became a military man, a commanding officer, command and control. So at a young age, he was taught how to be, but he was taught by his father how to be not so good. And then the army taught him, you know, just do as I say or I'll kick your ass. Now, when I came in this world, my neural nets, my neurons were empty, just like you. And all of a sudden, stuff's pouring in through my senses and thoughts and emotions wire together. Remember the, the dot, the diamond of thought? You yeah. know, thought creates an emotion, creates an action. By the way, if you, if you, it creates a behavior. If you, if you react, it never ends up well. If you use that pause, I said the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. it always ends up better. But you don't get the use of that till you're later in life. So, so here's here's my father, and everything that was wired into me, these thinking traps, mm -hmm. are actually roots. A lot of times, they are roots that link to mental health. So the there's ten of them. I have a, a a list of them, but a couple of the top thinking traps. And when I coach CEOs, or I should just say executives or anybody, I coach a lot of business leaders. We find those. And so the, the top few on the list are, I'm not enough, right? Mm -hmm. nothing, will, nothing will ever work out. There's things like catastrophizing where you, see, you always expect the worst. And I, I'm right now, I know a leader who cannot get perspective and talk positively about anything. They can only look at the dark side of what's not going right in their business. And they wonder why their team is stressed out. Uh, now, celebrating success, stre right? St stress stress is a, becomes distress over time, but yeah. you can actually take the Titanic and, and you can, you know, 
let it sink. Or you can lead your, your people, like I was saying about Costco, you can lead them and understand how you show up and your thinking traps can actually, if you're trying to get to the top of Mount Everest, you'll never get to the base camp unless you manage yourself. So going back to the story of my dad, a little bit about that, uh, my father's thinking tracks, if he was alive today and I, we could unravel it, probably one of the top ones is I'm not good enough, yeah. which is how his father treated him. And I'm not worthy. I'm not loved because in the Indian culture, men have difficulty expressing love. And so why I say this is every CEO that I talk to, I, always, I used to say, what's that one thing, a chip on your shoulder? Or i will say it this way. There's a fellow who runs a company, a large uh, bank, and he's a friend of mine. And he became CEO and he, he says, there's always that one chip on my shoulder that drives me all the time. That chip is actually a thinking trap. So what really drives you is something that was wired in your neural nets in a young age. That's what drives you. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. A no. professional athlete who wants to stand on the podium and have the gold medal, there is a, something that is it, wired in you that drives you to do what you do. And it's not just passion. It's actually part of uh, the way we're, we're programmed, the way we're programmed to think. Why would I travel all my life on an airplane, orphan my daughter, be so unhappy, uh, medicate with alcohol when I'm traveling and things like that, be under stress? You know, uh, at one point I was on medication for high cholesterol because I wasn't eating right. I was fit, chronically fatigued at a couple of points in my career. Why would I do all that? If you step back, you go, why would anybody do that? Why wouldn't I just find another career where I could work locally? I made the choice, by the way, and I say this to the leaders, I, that uh, somebody said to me at a, a young age, w w why are you pretending not to know, Tom? Because every decision you make is a direct result of the, the situation you, you're in. So if you don't like your job, find another job. If mm -hmm. you don't like traveling, find a job that doesn't require it. Mm -hmm. We're on the unthinking treadmill, but something, a thinking trap generally drives us. And it sometimes when it's an unhealthy thinking trap, it drives us the wrong way. So let me get back to something we talked about vulnerability. I do love Brene Brown's work. I just put 12 people through a program I do called the uh, Character Development Program. It's a one-year program. And it has multiple lessons with, with me face-to-face -face and in between work. I asked a question, I have a vulnerability quiz that they do, and uh -huh. I asked one question of all these 12, and these are general managers and up. Is vulnerability, what is it? And is it a, a strength or a weakness? 100% said it's a weakness. <laughs> what we did is using the, the things I've learned, we drilled down to the mom and dad question. So in one of my sessions, I say, what did you have to do to be loved or appreciated by your father? What did you have to do to be loved or appreciated by your mother? Whose love did you crave the most? Many of many of these people couldn't even say that they their parents loved them because it wasn't shown. They never knew. And so therefore they're going out into the world and they have these beliefs and thinking traps. And that is the why. That's driving them in terms of why they do what they do. Now, if we're going deep here, if you have a natural thinking trap that you haven't discovered, the good news is you can, and you can unwire it through neuroplasticity, which is simply teaching the brain through some repetitive skills to think differently. I call this bushwhacking. Well, let's say you're going down a pathway on a trail. You go every time you go down that trail, you go this way straight. One day you see a hole in the woods and you say, oh, I'm going to pause and go down there. And all of a sudden you come to this beautiful beach and there's this amazing playground. The next time you go on that walk, your brain is going to automatically, it's going to be looking at the trail and thinking, thought, emotion, behavior. Oh, there's that branch, looks like that the direction. You actually have to physically stop, pause to go down here. Now, if you do that for 30 days over and over, you rewire the pathways in the brain to go this way. It's no different than if I have a thinking trap. One of my thinking traps that I learned was I'm not good enough. The other one is I'm not loved because it's my you know, I was beat the shit out of by my talk alcoholic dad. Yeah, yeah. Now, I do have another part of that story I could get into if we have time, which is how I made peace with my dad before he died. But that's another another big story. Uh, so throughout my career, when I was getting accolades and, and uh, appreciations, I was winning awards or whatever it was that we do when we build companies and the good people be around us actually are the ones who make that happen. I couldn't see the goodness in it. And so I was doing all these things, burning myself out. 
So once you discover that, then you have to say, you can be mentally healthy if you learn some skills. And you mentioned one, uh, there's about five of my top, top ones I teach. Uh, my power, your morning, what you do before the last hour of the day, first hour of the day. There's a bunch of things you should be doing. Uh, meditation one, journaling one, uh, not, no phone, no emails, nothing. And what do most people do? They're up in the morning if they're leaders and they're on their uh, cell phones, smartphones. They're reading the newspaper, of which is all bad news because uh, the news is negative. So change, you got to learn some skills to change. Now, if you fall into uh, anxiety and depression like I did, anxiety, by the way, the cool way to explain it, I've never had it explained to me before until I got this one. It's a fraction. The numerator is the belief that bad things will happen, the denominator, the belief that I can cope with bad things. So oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's really good. Can you say that again? Yeah, can you, so yeah, for listeners? Yeah, yeah. So the anxiety can be put into a fraction. This is from clinical psychology. The, the top of it, the, the numerator is the belief that bad things will happen. The bottom yeah. is the belief that I can cope with the things that will happen. Now, when you feel anxious, here's something that will blow your mind that blew, blew my mind. Over 80% of people in the world have anxiety. Huh? Listen, if you're going into a board meeting and the, the numbers are off because of COVID and you can't find a way to answer the questions, you're going to get hit hard by questions at your board. You'll feel tingling. You'll feel a sensation of shortness of breath. You know, you got to do a one breath, which is breathe out and in, get that lungs emptied and, and breathe. So we have anxiety. It's normal. So that's the stigma. People say, ooh, you have anxiety. We all have anxiety. But anxiety, when the, when the numerator of that equation goes up and we don't work on the bottom that we can cope with those things, then anxiety becomes a, a, a what's called generalized or you can be diagnosed as having chronic anxiety. By the way, anxiety really is living in the moment. When I used to worry about the future all the time because it's part of my personality and, and I had unresolved things in the past. So I'm going into a board meeting and they say 90% of what you think about never happens. I'm already catastrophizing in my mind about having hit by the board. <laughs> so skills, if you learn skills to dial down the anxiety. So I would then visualize and I, so I'd work on the bottom of the equation. The more I believe that I can handle it, the less anxiety. So I would be before going into board meetings, do this, uh, everyone. Or if you don't have a board, if you just have a team meeting or you have a group of leaders you work with, visualize that you go into a room and you're going to get a standing ovation and you're going to be successful. Your brain won't know the difference. It visualize and anchor it in your mind. Now, there's, these are th the, uh, there's another component. There's another tool that I think is worth mentioning here is called fear setting. The anxiety, anxiety comes from, like you said, not being able to cope with the dangers or the risks ahead, right? So am I going to lose my job as a CEO? Is the board going to fire me? Is, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if, all these what ifs is when you sit down and you actually take the time to prepare, to plan, what kind of questions am I going to get? Okay, I'm going to get this question. I'm going to get that question. So that's what I like about when we talk about CEOs is to be able to be forward looking without losing traction of where you are is to kind of keep your head up and look in front of you and say, okay, where does the path lead? If that's the mountain that we have to go to, well, maybe going to the left and coming back across the river is the best way. Straightforward through adversity and let's just gung ho and bust through. That's not the way is to keep your head up and your chin up. And so therefore you assess the road forward. So what will happen? Do you really think that they're going to fire you? If you think that they're going to fire you, what's the root of that anxiety or that question? Have you not been doing your job properly? If you've already been successful, why would you not be successful? And that's living in the moment and trusting your team because that's the other component. People, the CEOs feel very alone when they're faced with a public company. I'm going into the board. Okay, guys, give me, make this deck as best as you can because I'm going to be there. I'm going to get my chops. I'm going to get punched in the face and not be afraid to let other people present. And that's the one thing that I've taught a lot of CEOs to say, get out of the way. You're talking to the board. Who said, where is it written that you have to present? Why can you not let the technician come in at the appropriate time? You can present and oversee. 
but it's okay to relinquish power. Just delegate, but do it diligently. People will in, will embrace that and see your ability to lead people that are smarter than you, like you mentioned. Yeah, they, threats, I don't, and anxiety I wanna, is so. I, I want to riff so on that. Funny how people can anchor themselves on these projections. My house is big. I don't want to fail. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And when you actually bring it down and go, holy shit, all of these are doomsday plans. Yeah. Like, I, I, I want to just riff on that because he sent me in a journey in my head. And then I do got to come back to the Tom Hanks story that I had written down here in my notebook. Yeah. And then I, I was distracted in my mind. Uh, look, you know, I'll talk about board meetings because I did. I've done many board meetings, and I've I've been. I was chair of the board for a mental health, uh, not for profit for ten years. There's many many things. Let's go back to what I was saying about the why. Why do you think? What are we pretending not to know? I'll say this to, uh -huh. to people. Uh, where where are your fingerprints on this issue? Okay, so the numbers aren't where they are. Results are off. There's maybe HR issues or culture, whatever it is. Yeah. Where are your fingerprints on it? What could you have done differently? Uh -huh. When you walk into a meeting, and if it's a board meeting, we'll just talk about that. It should never be where you have to do advanced planning for every question. You're right about planning. I, I do a lot of that for my board meetings. I have my financial statements because the board's strategic. They're not operational. So they're looking like if you're on the Titanic, they're looking with the binoculars for the danger. They're not supposed to be in the weeds. So going into board meetings, there's uh, there's different skills that uh, CEOs learn. One is the difference between strategy and operations. Uh -huh. You're now at the table with people who shouldn't be going into, what's the price of the uh, checking account that we're going <laughs> to, that's not it. The The question should be, our financials show that we're, 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 our margins are shrinking on our checking accounts, and therefore that could lead to issues with our profitability at some point. So we've looked at a way to fix that. That's what we're going to be doing. Number two is have a relationship strong with your board chair. You know, I was told when I started learning how to be a, a director on a board, uh, get to know something personal about your board chair. And especially if you're the CEO, get to know them on a level where there's a trust and rapport and they got your back. Because it should never be where you go into a board meeting and you get whacked for your performance. The board, through the chair, whoever does the CEO's performance, when I was board chair, I had a CEO that I actually was responsible for. And I was the conduit. So I would have a one-to-one -one check in with this person once a month pre-board meeting, we would talk and we prepare for the board meeting. Yeah. So I was seen as a support and advocate for the CEO. So you want to use your board chair properly because a board chair, if a good one exists, controls the behavior of the directors. Yeah. If they're out of line or whatever, they, they're not going to clobber you. The, other, the next thing I want to say is what you said is so true. Why we think we're going to be uh, fired or whatever, it most of the time, it's it, we, have, we can shift that in a heartbeat because it's our thought processes. It's maybe because we were failures and our father always used to say we're no good like me. These are not, these are thinking traps that some leaders have wired in them. They don't know why they do what they do, but I can tell you this. It's pretty much table stakes that when you go into a board meeting, if you know there's problems with the performance company, your brain's going to know that you're probably going to get some tough questions. Well, suck it up, sister, because that's what you're paid to do. And it's not personal if you are challenge on your leadership, whatever. That's what we're paid to do. That's why our lifespan is maybe four or five years, especially when you're in turnaround situation. However, what CEOs do have is the ability to influence. So another skill at the board table is influencing. So my, my job, if I go into a board meeting and I handle my communications right, is uh, my directors are usually lay people or they have an expertise. One's financial, one's legal. I always walk in there visualizing that I'm I'm the guy in the room that knows the most yeah. about what's going on in the company. So I can teach my brain to don't catastrophize and think that this is going to happen. I can focus on that's not going to happen. And yes, I'm going to get some tough questions, but I'm prepared to answer those. So when you become an influencer, you do different things. You, you build relationships with your board members. And you find two or three members on the board and through socialization, coffees, sometimes you'll develop relationships and you'll get what I call Somebody told me, a, friend, a good uh, boss I had once, he said, build currency, 
when you're climbing the ladder and you get in an organization. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. That's so, so you you build relationships with different people. So when somebody's out to whack you, you actually have others say, wait a minute, let's talk about this because Tom, he's, his performance is being strong here. So you have advocates. So all of this, but again, the one missing piece of the leader's performance in this area, you know, going into board meetings, is the mental health piece. I agree. What do you do the night before? Do you have a, a scotch or a bottle of wine? Or do you actually drink lots of water, hydrate? Do you go to bed and get eight hours sleep? Do you get up in the morning and uh, avoid a lot of coffee, uh, do some meditation, ground yourself, and go in there, the strongest, toughest mindset that they've ever seen? I'll tell you, we actually... Board members are like people are are just like normal people. Yeah. We we learn through visual body language. If I walk into a boardroom and my presence is there, automatically I have more confidence from my board. If if my presence isn't there, they call it executive presence, where I'm looking healthy, I'm feeling confident, positive. That can have an, an effect on the mindset. And if you, as the CEO, let your board get into negative thinking they're going to go down a certain, you can't get it back. This is what I learned in CBT course, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, that the brain can't have, well, I knew this from prior, you, you know this, the brain can't have a positive and negative thought at the same time. Uh-huh. Innovation, future, the future dreaming, it lies in the imagination. Al- Einstein said something like our, our, the future lies in our imagination. So think about this. If you go into a board meeting and you're trying to help that them steer the Titanic through the, the minefields or the icebergs. A board boards can't have a positive thought and negative at the same time. So if you've got to have skill to work with your chair and keep the conversation, you can go below the line and be negative, let them vent, but then you've got to go above that line and say, okay, now that we've got it out, we've identified the concerns, let's go above there. And for the next 10 minutes, only positive thoughts. So you, te- you work with your board chair, only positive thoughts, only ideas, because when we're in that positive thinking, th- we can get those ideas out. And that's where you, so a lot of leaders, by the way, who have mental health uh, challenges, you know, depression, anxiety, stress, they actually can't find solutions because they're so unhealthy. And then you wire yeah. in some thinking traps. So all this put together, I'm going to read you a little story I came to my mind about Tom Hanks. And then I'll uh, I'll just yeah. Then we'll move. then we'll recap because I I, yeah. I want to that there's that full circle because you just mentioned that full circle. Yeah. You know when you say what CEO yeah. don't talk about and that yeah. really about yeah. preparing yourself and being self aware. So yeah, give us the the Tom Tom, Tom, Tom Hanks and then uh, yeah. The, this was the when you talk about vulnerability, man. I mean, I love you for saying it because when a leader can be vulnerable, they be appear real. They appear like everybody else. And so if you grandstand, see, this is my vision and you're unreal, your people won't follow you. So Tom Hanks in the movie Saving Private Ryan, I remember this movie oh, yeah. and I use it as a story. There was a, there was a moment, if people didn't see the movie, watch it, it's hard to watch. But Tom Hanks was a school teacher and his, patro- his p- uh, platoon didn't know who he was. Yeah, they had and a he, bet going who he yeah, was. <laughs> that's right. And if you know Tom Hanks' demeanor, he was like that in the movie, very quiet, yeah. very respectful. And so they were being bombed the heck out of by above uh, the, this mountaintop. And there was a bunch of snipers in the yeah, enemy. Was, and they, were, yeah. they were pouring down shells on this. He got 100 troops or so. What he, all, what he knew was his commanding officers, so the penthouse, his bosses said, you have to take that hill. What he also knew just before he did it is that he's probably going to lose 70, 80% of his men because there was no air cover. He knew that. Now, he can get up and he can start standing and grandstanding and, uh, you know, being fearful. Or he can get up and be confident and positive and lead by example, but show his vulnerability a little bit. And he can say, guys, it's going to be tough. You know, we don't have all all the things we need, but I, I promise you, let's do this together. We can take that hill. And you get the men believing in you. A uh, leader's number one job, and this is a CEO as well, is to create an, uh, other leaders. That's a CEO's number mm-hmm. one job. Create other leaders and create a culture of leaders. It's not knowing how to read financials. It's your job when you're at that level is to create other le- leaders. That's a leader's role. That's a big part of it. So he cre- he created, he found his first follower, they call it, in this yeah. platoon, and they climbed the hill. But guess what? He lost a bunch of, ton of those guys. There was a magic moment in that scene where he, uh, they, the camera followed him closely. I think it was Spielberg did a great job of filming it. 
and he's his hand was shaking. Yeah, he, his hand he, was le- he left his guys and he went behind a rock. He took his helmet out, put it down on the ground, and he 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 put his head down and he wept. He cried. He he showed his vulnerability. Now, I'm not coming down on Tom Hanks for that, but in the military they teach you you can't cry in front of your men. Uh-huh. If he had showed some emotion or even after went to them and said, guys, I just, I just was, I'm not going to lie to you. I wasn't peeing in the bush. I, I actually just had to get a few tears out because that was, this is the most horrible thing. We did great. But is anybody here feeling the same way? I guarantee you all his other guys would probably shed a tear or give him a hug. Or some guys would say, I was waiting for you to say that, man, because I've been scared shitless. Yeah. that's vulnerability and yet the army taught him and that's the story there they taught him he can't be vulnerable our fathers and society teaches men they can't be vulnerable we go into boardrooms and we can't say to our board i'm a little stressed out guys i need to talk to you first so that i can dial that down that's the kind of thing by the way i did at my board table I and mean, this is real uh i put people on my board who had lived experience with mental health i actually asked for that as part of the criteria and I, and I said, I want to have a headstrong culture or a courage culture. And so we'd always start out with a check-in. How's everybody doing? How are we feeling? And is anybody right now experiencing anything that, that might be making them feel anxious, stressed? Let's talk about that because I'm feeling a bit that way before this meeting for a couple of reasons. But let's get that on the table. And when people start putting their armor off and People say, man, I didn't read the material because you guys only sent it out to me last night and my daughter's sick. And yeah, I guess it's been a tough time at my company. Uh, so I'm here with a little bit of undivided attention. Then every the armor comes off and everybody oh, yeah. get connects. So the Tom Hanks story is a great story, by the way, to use when you're teaching your, your leaders about the power of vulnerability Absolutely. Uh, and, and what he did in private, if you can then do that. Uh, on stage when you're in the company, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is this has been so much fun. I'm looking forward to the uh, the wrap up because uh, it's coming. <laughs> I, love, I mean, there's so much stuff. I mean, we could do we could do at least five or six more episodes. Yeah, I, I didn't tell you the dad story yet either. <laughs> so, w- with that said, uh, let's. Uh, where do we find your book? How do we get in touch sure. with you? All yes. that all that contact information and what you got to share. Yes, thank you. The uh, the website is www.create, K-R-E-A-T, dot C-A, Martin. Uh, it's play on words. Now, dot C-A, not dot com. It's a yeah. Canadian, Canadian company. And you'll see a, a media page there. You'll see an info form to contact me. Uh, that's everything. My book page is there. We'll be putting something up about the feature film and all the other work, my podcast. Uh, if you want to get a hold of my book, uh, it can be bought from any online or in your bookstore. It's also available, Martin, in audiobook. Uh, I hired a voice actor to bring it to life. And so for busy people, it's about five. five. Title of your book, please. Yeah, I, I'm going to hold it up. Oh, yeah, there you go. There it is. It's the called Warrior. The Way of the Quiet Warrior, 90 Days yes. to the Life You Desire. And I wrote it as a hybrid business book and, and fable, like Patrick Lencioni style, where there's six fa- fable chapters that are actually real events that have been turned into stories. And then there's six uh, chapters uh, teaching uh, basically uh, how to be successful and happier uh, when you're in business or in, in when you're even in your life outside of the office. Travis, well, thank you very much, Tom. Dada, like butter, I can't get that out of my end now. <laughs> it's been an amazing episode. There's just, when you peel the onion, there's just so many more layers to the human being. And to, to wrap this up, you know, stay physically fit, stay emotionally fit. And ultimately, don't be afraid to talk about your mental fitness. Be that person who is open, vulnerable, and open to demonstrating to others that what you got in your coconut between your two ears and behind those beautiful eyes to say, hey, I need to take care of that organ as well. So uh, thank you very much, Tom. It's been a pleasure having you on. Martin, thanks for having me on. I had a lot of fun. Oh, good. Thank you very much. So my name is Martin Hunter. I am the host of What CEOs Talk About, where we translate strategy into frontline operations. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to What CEOs Talk About. 
Make sure to click subscribe to get notified about future episodes or check us out at www.whatceostalkabout.com.